So, I, again, I feel a little bit nostalgic. Last time I was here, I was back in that corner. We're having lunch, and one of my heroes, Paul Kurtz, and I had, had lunch together. Uh, Joe, do you remember that? I think the three of us kind of sat there, and, uh, and Paul has gone on to his reward. I, I wanted to make it to his funeral, and I had a trip to Canada that week. I just I couldn't make it work. But uh, it, it is such, I think, a privilege to be able to, to uh, stand on the back of, of so many giants that have gone on before. And Paul was one of those, those incredible giants in the faith to me, one of my, one of my mentors. And, uh, and now I look up to, to young guys like Joe, uh, who has taken on this vision of proclaiming the word of God. I was, I was so excited when I found out that uh, Job was called to the ministry here. You guys have no, exci- no, no idea how excited I was about that. And uh, he said all that stuff about his theology. and that it, you, you guys don't believe that, right? There's, there's some things you don't believe that Joe says. Is that right? So uh, in any case, I'll try to straighten out my theology here today. Um, I've had a great time with your young people um, this uh, weekend. We've been uh, talking about life purpose and, uh, and before I go there, i got to show you a picture. Th- this is me riding a Texas Longhorn last night. And uh, they actually brought a bull into your church. Can you believe that? I, this is the only church that I know would ever do that. Like, like you, you guys, every, I guess since Joe came, you do crazy things. Um, but it was, it was fantastic. We had a great banquet. And uh, this morning, we're going to be talking about uh, 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 life as, as worship, um, but not just life, but a particular part of our life, uh, work as worship, because most of us, most of our days are filled with work. And I grew up in uh, church world. I grew up on the mission field. In fact, I was, I was a missionary for uh, 10 years of my life. And, uh, and I, I always kind of grew up with a statement, um, full-time ministry. You ever heard that one before? And, and, you know, we, we bring preachers up front. We bring missionaries up front. When young people go to the mission field, we bring them up front. We lay hands on them. We bless them. We're just like, like man, they've got really big halos. Now, we don't really say that, but that's kind of what's implied. Anybody who's in full-time ministry, man, I'm telling you, they got like a special place in heaven. And, and then, you know, when it comes time to, uh, you know, funding a new building project or sending somebody on a mission, then we go tap those business guys and say, hey, we need some help. <laughs> now you guys are special. And, uh, and, and folks, I have a real problem with that. Can, can I say that right out front? I have a real problem with that. I think we are all called to full-time ministry. That's kind of my thesis this morning. We're going to unpack this. I believe biblically we have a model for this. We are all called to do full-time ministry. And I don't care if you are scrubbing toilets, if you are building uh, uh, storage buildings, if you are an engineer, your life is worship. Your work is worship. And even scripture will tell us that as we, as we look into it this morning. Now, I grew up on a small farm in southern Ontario, Canada. Um, we had pigs, goats, cows, chickens, and of course some cats and a dog. And uh, I learned to work hard. Work was, a, was an ethic that our family had. We had daily chores. Um, we had field work that required us to harvest the annual crops. Uh, my father also had a construction business on the side that I worked for. Um, Monday through Saturday was reserved for work in our home in our community, in our, in our paradigm of church. And, uh, but come Sunday, we left the job site and we focused on a day of rest. Now, perhaps not so much for my father. He was a bivocational uh, person after all. He served as a pastor at our, our small country church. And uh, therefore, ironically, my dad worked seven days a week. Now, for me, whether it was taught or simply caught, There was this definite divide between the sacred and the secular in my worldview. There was a difference between a day of rest and the days of work. One was sacred and the others were all secular. In fact, as a young Canadian who loved playing hockey, I was strictly forbidden to play the sport on the Sabbath. We had a little pond down below our barn and uh, we could go down there and skate around in circles. (laughs) We could not take our hockey sticks down there. Sunday was sacred. Work, pleasure, and all sports activities were secular and especially frowned on. Now, some things have certainly changed since my childhood youth. We've taken many more liberties on the Sabbath, some that are not so good. I mean, how many of us don't rest as we should? We really don't cease from our labors and activities. We really don't take a day of rest before we hit the office Monday morning. We're already answering email at home before Monday. And I think there's a lot that could be said on that front this morning. Um, That's for another sermon at another time. 
And I do believe we need to truly rest and take a break on the Sabbath. I really believe that. I think God designed us that way. But there's something greater amiss that I would rather focus on this morning. Something that perhaps goes to the very root of this issue. And that's the sacred, secular divide in our thinking that I want to talk about. Most of us Christians, uh, most of us in church world, uh, we, we, are, we, we see ministry as, as holy and highly esteemed and, and work-related vocations are secular. A little less holy at least. Certainly not as important as the kingdom of God. And I want to try to challenge that notion this morning. Consider a TGIF uh, restaurant. How many of you have, have eaten at a TGIF? Let me see your hands real quick. Yeah, it's good food. And we, we love to go to TGIF. And I don't know if you know what TGIF stands for or not, but it captures a sentiment expressed among many Christians, which is, thank God it's Friday. In other words, cursed be Monday through Friday, for therein is my dreaded labors, my toil, and my work. Now others will say something similar on either Sunday morning or Sunday night or early the next morning on their way to work. I hate Mondays. They're not defined by TGIF throughout the week, but by IHM on Monday morning. And when Tuesday rolls around, isn't it Friday yet? Now let me ask you, is that based on a biblical perspective? Is work really evil? Should there really be a sacred, secular divide? Is a worship service on Sunday morning more holy, more sanctified, more pleasing in God's sight than what we engage in Monday through Friday? Are pastors and missionaries the only folks in full-time ministry? Or could that same be said of those of us that work in the office on Monday morning, those of us engaged in construction, those of us at home scrubbing a toilet, those of us teaching in a classroom, those of us that are, 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 are doing a culture at a lab. Is that holy? Is that sanctified? What do we really mean by full-time ministry? Shouldn't we all be engaged in that, whether it's Sunday or Monday through Saturday? I want to take a look at a brief biblical text. If you want to turn there, or you can see it on the screens, Matthew 21, 33 to 40. One. This is where we're going to be, be uh, basing uh, part of my talk this morning. And uh, we're going to be taking a little bit of a different look at this story than we normally do. Listen to another parable, Jesus says. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, he dug a wine press in it, and he built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and he moved to another place. And when the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, they killed another, they stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them, more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. And last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him, threw him out of the vineyard, and they killed him. And therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Now, typically, when we study this passage, we center our attention on Israel's rejection of the Messiah. That's typically where we go with this parable. Today, however, I want to focus your attention on some other issues, some side issues that are connected to this story. First, you've got a landowner who plants a vineyard. He puts a wall around it, and he digs a wine press, and he builds a watchtower. What I want to ask you this morning is, are there possibly some echoes of Eden in this story? A vineyard, a garden, a wall, a watchtower. Think about the angels guarding the garden. God as, as the one who comes down and walks with them in the cool of the day. God creates this amazing world, and he plants a garden in the east, in Eden, as it states in Genesis 2.8. Do we have a connection to this parable? And we might ask, was it possibly near here? <laughs> uh, you can definitely catch glimpses of Eden when you visit Cleveland, um, or right here in Holmes County, Ohio. I don't know if you folks realize or not how incredibly beautiful it really is here. There's reasons why people come and visit your, 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 your county. The valleys, the, the, the farmland, the garden. 
possibly Eden was, was, maybe this is the original Eden. Well, in any case, God puts man in this beautiful garden to do what? To work it, to take care of it, to cultivate it. Most importantly, note that humanity was engaged in work prior to the fall. Clearly, work is not evil. God commissioned mankind, humanity, to work. He gave them a mandate, if you will, to cultivate, to plant. I think that implies reaping a harvest, being productive, being fruitful. The curse of sin is what introduced the thorns, the thistles, the sweat into the work equation. But work itself was not evil. Based on this passage, we could say that work regards stewarding these beautiful resources on our planet. And why is that? It's the benefit for all creation, isn't it? We are valuing creation. We're literally putting worth on it when we work. In fact, that's what worship means, to attribute value and worth on something outside of us. Worship is putting worth and value on something that God values. Last August, I was in Istanbul, Turkey, to speak at a business as mission conference. So uh, there's this group of, of missional people, Christians, who travel around the world and they get into some of the most difficult countries and they start businesses and they get access to people who, who work for them from the Muslim faith, the Hindu faith, the Buddhist faith, and other faiths. And uh, they begin to share the gospel with the people as they work. It's a brilliant way to establish mission around the world through business, business as mission. And they asked me to come and be their guest speaker. My friend, a new friend, Patrick Lai, gave me his latest book um, at that conference called Workship. He's coined a new word called Workship. Um, it comes from a, a Hebrew word that I'm going to show you here in just a moment. In fact, just a few uh, months ago, I was invited to uh, a, a company in this community and they said, Luke, we want to use that Hebrew word for the name of our company. They had heard me speak at a, at, a, at a business event on this term, and they said, we actually, we love this. We want our company to reflect worship. Now, after he gave me this book, I thought, well, maybe I'll read it on, my, on, the, on the flight back home, but I was struggling with jet lag, and uh, I, you know, most books are boring, so I thought, well, I'll, I'll get up, I'll read it in the middle of the night, I can't sleep anyhow, and uh, it'll probably put me back to sleep. But it didn't. <laughs> I stayed up and I finished the whole thing that night. So it's a good book. It's called Workship. Now here's what Patrick Lye pointed out in his book that blew me away. The Hebrew text in the Bible has one root for our English words. Work, serve, and worship are all the same word. Avodah or avoda. I, I, I'm not a Hebrew scholar. I'm not really sure how you say that. But avodah, I believe it is. Work, serve, and worship are all the same thing. This is how God sees our work. It's serving and it is worship. It's putting worth and value on something outside of ourselves for the benefit of all creation, for the benefit of everyone else. It's fascinating. Our work and our service should be an act of worship. In other words, whatever we do ought to be focused outside of us. We ought to be putting worth and value outside of us on something greater than us. We ought to be involved in a mission, a purpose greater than us. Our business should be more than about us. So we have this principle of workship established from the very beginning of time. Next, I want you to note that in Genesis 1.28, God commanded them to be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth, and subdue it. Folks, there's a lot packed into that statement that theologians have been unpacking for a long time. Rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, over every living creature that moves on the ground, God says. I want you to take authority. I want you to be fruitful. I want you to multiply and to rule. We are to subdue the earth and rule over it. And that does not mean that we indiscriminately abuse or waste our planet, our resources. You can call me a tree hugger of sorts. I'm not. I'm not one of those left-wing whack job but here's the other side of it, folks. Sometimes we reject all creation care. And God put us in a garden, and he's going to end the thing in a garden. And I just don't think we should waste our resources. Can I say that? Among a group of conservatives. We ought to all have a tree that we go out and hug daily. That's what I just said. You can laugh at that. I don't believe that. I don't hug my tree. 
But I think we ought to take care of our planet. I think we ought to be concerned with conserving our planet. I really do. It's a, it's a, when God created, he called it good. We're going to end up in Eden someday. All right? So I don't think we should be indiscriminate. I don't think we should be destructive. And, you know, it includes Bambi. Ooh, it got quiet in here. See, here's the thing. I never grew up with guns. I was never a hunter. But I'll tell you this. If you shoot Bambi, just invite me over. I'll help you eat him, all right? I have no problems with you destroying Bambi, by the way. I went out one time and tried to kill Bambi, and uh, I think he got within 15 feet of me and my single-shot shotgun somehow missed. I, we have no idea how that happened. Haven't been back hunting since. It also means, folks, that we don't worship creation. Let me be very clear on this. God placed us in authority over creation. We are called to use it as a resource. We are called to be wise in how we use it as a resource. We could say a lot about creation care. But it is never to be, to just balance this equation on creation care, we don't preserve it at the expense of humanity either. A few years ago, we saw extreme reactions of public outrage in America to the hunting of lions in Africa. Does anybody remember Cecil? Okay, I got a few hands out there. Cecil was this lion that this dentist, I believe, from up there in Minnesota shot on a, on a trip to uh, Africa. Uh, you might remember the death of Harambe in a zoo down here in Cincinnati, just an hour and a half from, uh, from here, I believe. It was also about an hour and a half from where we lived at the time. How many of you remember Harambe? <laughs> All right. Okay, now I, I disagree with the senseless slaughter of animals. I, I don't think we should be out there indiscriminately slaughtering animals. But I'm also aware that some villagers in Africa rejoiced at the death of another lion because of the threat that it posed to their lives. Look at what this, uh, what this New York Times article said. We Zimbabweans are left shaking our heads wondering why Americans care more about African animals than about African people. And that's quite a powerful statement. I, I, I know there's a lot of people concerned about dolphins and dogs, <laughs> but they don't care about the unborn. They don't care about people. They're more concerned about animals than they are. Ha anybody notice this? I think I did the cat and dog seminar here. Did, did I at one time in, in your lives? And uh, you know what's funny? I, I don't do that much anymore. And every time that I do that seminar, I have to preface it with some disclaimers. I'm not talking about your cat. <laughs> okay, some of you are getting lost. I have no idea what you're talking about. Luke, cats, dogs, theology. Ask your neighbor who was there. But the reality is people are absolutely fanatical about animals. And, and I love animals. I, I grew up with pets. I'm not anti-animals. But we are actually putting them above people these days. Humanity, my friends, is a triumph. It was very good when God created humanity. It's a triumph of his creation, endowed with work, endowed with the responsibility to rule, to resource, to steward these resources for his benefit and the glory of God. And I think sometimes we Americans have a misplacement of affections with our pets. Uh, when we lived in Kentucky a number of years ago, we had a, we had a dog, and, and my, my family uh, said we have to name him Rascal, and I disagreed, but they outvoted me, and he truly lived up to his name. He was a puggle, and uh, we did not know there was all this chatter going on in the background of our neighborhood. Somebody at church told us, Luke, do you know what's happening in, th in the neighborhood about your dog? And I said, no, I have no idea. Now, I grew up in southern Ontario. It was very cold. Uh, we had pets, we had a dog, and uh, it got really cold. We put the dog in the barn, we took care of our animals. But in Kentucky, which is kind of, you know, mid-south, not that cold, we had even bought an igloo. Anybody know what an igloo doghouse is, okay? He was happy with the, his environment. Um, we walked our dog a couple times a day. We took great care of a dog. We loved our dog. But we were cruel in the eyes of our neighbors because in the wintertime, we didn't take him into our home. We had got him an igloo. <laughs> That's what we do in Canada. We, we sometimes live in igloos. And uh, apparently we were, I, somebody found out I was a motivational speaker. They found my website. They sent me an email said, if you have compassion of God, <laughs> ooh, they pulled that one out, you are going to take better care of your dog. It was, I'm, I'm so glad some of you are laughing because some of you are going, yeah, you should, you should have had your dog in the house and, you know, put him in the master bed and all this. I just don't get into that, okay, folks? I'm so sorry. But Rascal was a rascal, and he deserved to be outside, and he had an igloo. Well, I went on Amazon, and I bought a $30 electric blanket for Rascal. The poor dog, he was freezing cold. Of course he was, every, you know. And uh, you know what he did? <laughs> he chewed it up and spat it outside his igloo. <laughs> All right, we got to get back to the sermon. I think there's sometimes an overemphasis on animals. Our work includes stewardship, management of the earth. 
Some time ago, my wife and I, actually about a year ago, we were, we were, I was doing a perspectives class. I think it was over in Indiana. And uh, we stayed in the home of a warden, wildlife management officer. Now, some of you don't like game wardens, and, and uh, we found this guy really interesting. He was, he was telling us all about the deer population, and, and, you know, these guys actually believe in what you do. They want you to be out there hunting. You, you have to control Bambi, all right? You really do. And when you control them, just remember, invite me over for steak. God placed us in this beautiful garden to survive and thrive in the context of work. Second, I want you to note in our text that God is expecting a fruitful harvest. Simply sitting around doing nothing or very little is not an option for us, folks. Laziness is not an option for the believer. Consider the parable of the three servants. They were given one, two, and five talents respectively to invest while their master was gone. And the one who buried his talent, who buried the ability that God had given him, given him these resources, the one who buried it was condemned. Folks, we are called to be fruitful, to multiply. I, I, I like to tell churches today that God wants to raise up more millionaires. Did you know that? I think he'd even love to see some more billionaires. Now, sometimes we have problems talking about money in church. I, don't, I have no problem. God talks a lot about money in the Bible. We're called to be fruitful, to to invest wisely. We're called to multiply. Now, now those resources are not meant for us. They're to expand the kingdom of God. And so if you're buying multiple boats and multiple condos and even maybe investing in an island in the Caribbean, then maybe we need to talk about your millions, all right? But if you are building a greater business, you're employing more people, therefore you're discipling more people, and you're able to make more money so you can expand the kingdom of God, I, I understand, I didn't know this, but you guys are starting a new project here, a new building project in the next year, right? You're, ex, you're, you're trying to expand the kingdom of God by building onto this place. Is, is that, was that secret? That, that, I, I just let out the, the cat out of the bag. Um, okay, maybe the project's like, I don't know when. But, but, but you guys, we do this with our finances, with our resources. We are, we are stewards, Right? And when we take our money and the, and the ability that God has given us, folks, we are called. Some of us have the gifts, honestly. We've got like five talents instead of just two or one. And by the way, God is not fair. Just, just to set that out there. Some of us have a real problem with, with, with equality these days. And, and God is not fair, but God is just. God is good. And if God was fair, none of us would be here. I'm so glad God is not fair. The reality is some of us honestly have more gifts than others. Some of us actually have the ability to make lots of money. We're just, God has given us the gift of being business people. Folks, that's a stewardship. You are required by God to take your five and turn it into ten, all right? And you are required by God to invest in the kingdom of God. I meet these business guys all the time, and I want to tell you something. Some of them are so filled with joy because they're always giving away and they're always investing in the kingdom, and they found the delight of business. It's amazing to work with people like that. You've got some of them right here in this congregation. You've got some of them all over this community, in fact. We are called to be faithful stewards of what God has entrusted to us to invest in the kingdom of God. Our talents, our skills, our resources. Our work is sacred. In fact, if we waste our time, if we waste our energy, and we waste our abilities, we are not fulfilling the mandate that God has given us. In that case, our laziness, our non-work, we could call profanity. The opposite of workship. I want that one to set for a little bit. Profanity, folks. Seriously, Luke? You're going to call that profanity? Yes. Consider that those in our text today who did not steward the vineyard that was entrusted them were judged in the harshest terms. Their act of non-worship, using their work to the glory of God, stewarding their resources was severely punished. It was a profanity, folks. We have two options, workship or profanity. If we do not place worth and value on our stewardship responsibilities, we are profaning our work. And if we fail to take our work seriously as an act of worship and only regard it as a means to selfish fulfillment, we've also missed the point of our work. My mentor, Dr. Kinlaw, taught me a key principle of the universe regarding our design. He said, we are designed to be outward focused, not inward focused. You know, you take a look at the Trinity. God the Father was all about the Son. This is my Son, listen to him. What did the Son say? I'm here to do my Father's will. And then he said the Spirit, when the Spirit comes, he will speak about me, about Jesus the Son. 
In the Trinity, you've got worship going on. Every member of the Trinity is focused on the other. And you and I were created in that image. We were designed to be outward focused. Our marriages work better. <laughs> Our businesses work better. Everything goes better when you and I are focused on the other when we're focused on our employees, when we're focused on our clients, when we're not self-centered. I think it was Zig Ziglar who once said, if you help enough other people get what they want in life, you'll get what you want in life. And some people judge him rather harshly and say, well, you know, that's very self-centered because he's out to get, give so that he gets. If you knew Zig, you know that's not what he meant at all. What he was saying is that if we live with an abundance mentality, we live with a generosity mindset, if we live with the, with the desire to serve, to bless, to make the world a better place, even the Bible says this, cast your bread on the waters and in many days it will be returned to you. There is a principle of the universe, folks, that when you and I live with an abundance mentality, when we take our resources that we steward and we begin to throw it out there and bless the world, something happens. Something comes alive because we are acting in accordance with the principle of the universe. Dr. Kinlaw taught me this definition of sin, captured by Augustine way back in the 15th or 16th century. I can't remember which one. It's a Latin term, in curvatus in se, in curvatus in se, which simply means curved in on oneself. When we operate, that's what he said sin is, when we are curved in. When we operate with an outward focus, serving others, serving God, versus an inward focus of serving me, things just go a whole lot better in life. Marriage, employees, clients, when my work is focused on the betterment of others in society, I am operating in alignment with the grain of the universe. Stanley Hauerwas from Duke University brought this term to my mind a number of years ago, and I like that statement. There is a, a you know, a lot of us, we work with wood, right? And you want to cut with the grain, and the universe was actually designed a certain way. And when you operate within the principles of that universe, when we align with the grain of the universe, life just goes a whole lot better. And that's one of the reasons why I've dedicated my life to teaching on serving leadership. In the business world, in the church world, I work with pastors around the world as well on this, I believe that we are called to serve, to be outward focused. We are aligning with the grain of the universe, folks, when we do that. We are curved out, not curved in. Augustine's definition of sin. See, when I'm curved in on myself with my work, my marriage, whatever it is, then I begin to degenerate into prideful outcomes. I lie, I steal, I cheat, I abuse. I do whatever it takes to make me look good and use others for my benefit. We see this in the business world. We see this in marriages. Work is now all about self-worship. I'm curved in on myself instead of curved outward. My work is no longer a workship. It's focused on building my agenda, my empire, and serving self. Need a real world example? How many of you remember uh, Bernie Ebers from WorldCom? This is a scandal that rocked the business world about 20 years ago, I believe. Um, he went off to prison. He, he recently got out and uh, died six months later. These were huge scandals that rocked the world a number of years back, especially in the business world. Uh, Bernie Ebers, by the way, was a self-proclaimed Christian. So was Kenneth Lay. There was a, another big scandal at that time at Enron. Um, both of these CEOs uh, 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 really raped their company's uh, uh, retirement funds is what they did. They stole from their, their people's future. And both of these men were Sunday school teachers. Both of these men believed in what you and I say we believe in, but Monday through Saturday was a completely different world for them than Sunday. They massively ripped off their employees while professing faith in Christ. As Sunday school teachers, their work was not worship. Rather, they were serving self with their work. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, Paul states, For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do if you're an artist in the auditorium today I, I'd love to see your hand real quick if you just slip it up if you're an artist you love art great I got one over here anybody any other artists um, if you're a singer you're an artist by the way if you love to draw and paint you're an artist we got a few more going up I go, good I like to see artists um, you, you might like this word handiwork it comes from the very same Greek root from which we derive our English word, poem. 
Now, now Paul is not actually implying poetry in this passage, but the word handiwork um, actually comes from the original Greek word that looks like our English word poem. It's where we get our English word poem. Paul is referring to us as God's masterpieces. We are his poetry, okay, if you will. And God is building us. We could certainly say that in one sense, God writes another stanza here in 2022 with our life. 2023, he writes another stanza in our poetry. Every time we engage in something, we build something, God writes another line to his poem. We are his handiwork, we are his poetry as we engage in work. Furthermore, we are made in God's image. I already brought that out in terms of being outward focused, but I'd like to look at another aspect of the image of God. What's the first thing that God did? What's the first thing that we read in scripture that God did? Shout it out. He created heaven and earth. He created. You and I were made to do what? To create. We were made to build things, to design things, to come up with new ideas. We were made to create. You and I were created to do good works. If you are an artist engaging in our culture, I want to speak to you for a moment. Your work is sacred. Your work is worship. If you are engaged in culture, your work is sacred. Your work is worship. All work that enhances our culture or our society is worship. Now, Andy Crouch, uh, an author that I, I, uh, I really like some of his stuff that he has to say in, in, in about culture, um, he's pointed out that many of us as Christians in the last century, the last hundred years, we have had a very negative uh, perspective toward culture. We're kind of anti-culture in many ways. And uh, he says we have assumed these postures, kind of you know, bracing ourselves toward culture. He said the first um, posture that we assumed toward our posture is that we condemned everything that came out by society and culture. It was just bad. Um, take music for a moment. If music was not performed by Christians or written by Christians, it was condemned as secular music. Over time, we moved toward another posture, and that was to one of critique. Um, we've had some really brilliant people in the last hundred years that have helped us critique things. And I think that's a posture that uh, some would say is a good thing to have. I would like to suggest otherwise. I think as a gesture, it's a good thing, but not as a posture. We shouldn't be criti critiquing everything. But that's the, that's the assumption, the, the posture that we took for a number of, of years in the last century. We put everything under the sacred microscope. Um, anybody remember the days of Christian rock and roll? <laughs> I grew up in that era, by the way. I'm 50 now. And uh, it was all evil, right? Christian rock and roll was, was considered evil. Um, after we critiqued everything, we kind of went through an era in Christianity where we copied stuff. Right now, now we just, we just, like the Christian rock and roll is a great example. We began to, to copy stuff, and, and uh, whatever the world did, we just copied it. Um, we had Christian punk, screamo, rap. We had all kinds of stuff coming down the music line. And then finally, folks, the last posture that we have assumed in our Christian culture today is we just consume. We don't critique. We don't condemn. We don't copy. We just consume it. Whatever comes out of the world's um, mouth, we just say, it, yeah, we'll just consume it. We, we watch all kinds of movies. We listen to all kinds of music. We look at all kinds of paintings. We, we don't care. We just, we just consume. It's become a posture in what I would call liberal Christianity. Hopefully that's not defined here this morning. Now, here's what I want to point out, folks. And this, this is not me. This is Andy Crouch. He says that we ought to not have these as postures, but rather as gestures. There are things that we ought to condemn about work and culture, by the way. There are business ethics that are not ethics at all. And as a gesture of critique or condemnation, there are times where we have to condemn that. We have to call it out, or we have to critique it. There are some things considered culture today that in my books are simply profane in the world of art. And I'm talking about modern art right now. I'm going to offend some of you who love art, but uh, this is not art in my books. I could do that. It's really easy, all right? And yes, you can come up to me afterwards and attempt to convince me why this is, you know, the lines and colors are arranged with such amazing symmetry and speak to some deeper meaning. And oh my goodness, Luke, you just missed what Mondrian's trying to say there. I'm not buying it, all right? So I don't get into some of this stuff that's called, I critique it, all right? I just do. 
But if you are talking about our famous Chicago bean, officially known as Cloudgate, well then I'm okay with some modern expressions of art. Please come visit us sometime. We love our Chicago bean. I believe we ought to critique from time to time, picking and choosing what is good and right. But we should not assume these as postures. There is also a time to copy what non-Christians are doing. I think a lot of the world has come up with some really great ideas. We can copy those. It's a gesture, not a posture. And can I just say this yet to the Christian world? <laughs> I, uh, I have to laugh as I, as I and again, we, we've all been caught up in this, folks, but you know, there's things that come down the pipe and we just embrace things and it's like, at one time it was just really super cool for worship leaders to wear skinny jeans. Because if we didn't, we weren't relevant. <laughs> Do you know the word relevant? You know what relevant is? It's playing catch up with the world. I don't think we're called to be relevant. I think we're called to be creators. What if you and I created culture and the world's like amazed at the stuff we made, at the music we made? Do we have to copy and critique and condemn all the time? What if we became creators, which I hope you're capturing now. I'm leading to my next discussion on postures. But one more statement yet about consumption before I move there. There are some times where I don't critique, I don't copy, and I certainly uh, I don't condemn. I simply consume. And that's when my good friend little Roy from this community invites me over for a steak. Or I'm told that there's a little restaurant down in Baltic now that does a pretty mean steak on a green egg. Is that right? All right. Last night here, man, I tell you, I didn't critique. I didn't copy. I, I, I didn't condemn for sure. I simply consumed. We had an amazing meal, thanks to your uh, group of people that put that together for the youth. Um, I don't typically ask my local host too many questions about the food I'm served. I simply consume it. And there's a time for consuming. But folks, these four ought to be gestures, not postures. And there's a huge difference between us assuming a posture and having gestures. And I hope that sticks this morning because we do have to be uh, analytical as we look at our culture around us. And we have to be uh, moving to the next one here now. Um, I believe that we need to assume the postures of creating and cultivating. Um, I agree with Andy Crouch on this. This is a mandate from Scripture. This is back in Genesis. We are called to create and to cultivate. That's the Genesis narrative right there, folks. And when we create and cultivate, our work is worship. When we create and cultivate, our work is worship. We become marketplace witnesses when we create good things with our work. For some of us here, that might include the storage barn industry. We make life easier for people by creating storage solutions. We're serving society in this way, plus we're creating jobs for people so they can support themselves and their families. Our work is worship. Furthermore, we create numerous opportunities to disciple our employees and align them with the grain of the universe. What great opportunities we have Saturday or, or Monday through Saturday or Monday through Friday, most of us, Monday through Friday, to, to impact our employees. Think about that. We've got way more time than the preacher does Sunday morning to engage with our people, to disciple them, to align them with the grain of the universe. Secondly, we are marketplace witnesses when we cultivate, when we build on what is already good, when we draw out from society and we cultivate it, we turn it into something good. We cultivate, we create what is already good in our society. Our work is worship. Let's take a brief look at Colossians 3, 23 to 24. And I, and I am winding down, folks. I, I, uh, I need to catch a flight back to Chicago this afternoon. And uh, they said, don't go too long. They kind of know I'm a long-winded preacher. But I am winding down. And by the way, you should never believe a preacher when he says that. Um, finally, my brothers, said Paul, I think like in the end of, what is it, the beginning of chapter 3 in Philippians, then he writes two more chapters. Finally, my brothers. Um, so, but we are, we are winding down. I want to leave you with a few scriptures yet. This one comes from Colossians, and uh, he says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not for human masters. How would your work change this week if you went out working for the Lord and not for your boss, your manager, your employer? What would that look like? He says, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward when you work at it with all your heart, because it is the Lord Christ you are serving. First note that we are called to work with all our heart. 
This qualifies it as worship, workship. Rick Warren actually once said that if your heart is not in it, you are in the wrong job. If you are not working at it with all your heart, Rick Warren says, you are sinning. Marcus Buckingham has done a lot of work um, in this area of, of people and their careers and their jobs, and he has discovered through all his research that 40 to 60 percent, and I don't care if you're in Canada, United States, Mexico, Japan, Thailand, it doesn't matter where you're at, he has discovered that 40 to 60 percent of people in their careers and jobs today hate their work. That's a tragedy. 40 to 60 percent of people in the work world hate their jobs? Guys, we were made to love our work. We were made to create. We were made, and so if you're in the wrong job, get another job or get another attitude. We were called to love, to engage our work. Second, whatever we do, wh whatever we do, it's working as unto the Lord, for the Lord. All work is holy. There's no dichotomy between the secular and the sacred. In fact, according to this text, we are serving Christ through our work. So if you are a teacher or a trainer this morning, your work is holy. Your work is sacred. If you work as a welder, your work is holy. Your work is worship. If you are a stay-at-home mom, your work is holy. Your work is worship. If you work in design, you build websites, your work is holy. Your work is worship. If you are in the medical world, your work is holy. Your work is worship. If you are a supervisor, you work in quality control. Your work is holy. Your work is worship. And yes, if you are a chef, your work is definitely holy. And not only is your work worship, but you help me worship. I didn't hear an amen to that. Yeah, we like to eat. You get the point. Now in Deuteronomy 23, 12 to 13, and I'm just putting that up there for reference. You'll have to jot it down and look it up. We even see a demonstration of God's concern and rule over various sectors of society, including the sewage system. Fascinating. If you work in sewage, your work is holy. Your work is sacred. All work that we engage in is holy, and that's why I have a problem with clock watchers. <laughs> we should be just as excited going to work as we are when we leave it. None of us should be characterized by TGIF or IHM. Thank God it's Friday or I hate Mondays. That should not be named among us, folks. We should be pumped and charged when we go home on Friday night. I don't blame you. I love the weekend. But we ought to be just as charged and pumped when we leave for work Monday morning. You see, TGIF and, and IHM reflects more of the world's opinion of work. It's a necessary evil. That's primarily about earning a living and making me look good in the process. <laughs> but no, my work is worship. My work is holy. It's sacred. We give God our best through efforts enabled and ultimately by him. Remember the Rick Warren quote? If my heart's not in it, I'm in the wrong job. If I'm not working with all my heart, I am actually sinning. I am profaning my work. My work is holy. My work is sacred. Two passages to encourage and exhort you as we close. And uh, I, Joe, I forgot to ask you what time you guys normally close. What? It doesn't matter. Oh, good. All right. Well, my flight's not till like 2 o'clock. So um, I think there's a potluck. I think we're going to do some worship over, over a meal today. Um, I, I, maybe I should talk with the cook since Joe doesn't care. Um, we're, we're just about done, folks. But I, I do want to do one last thing before I close. I actually want to get you into groups, and I want you to have a short discussion. You can make it two minutes, three minutes, whatever you want to do. But uh, I want to talk a little bit about this in, in practical terms. So let's look at some passages yet in closing. Romans 12, 1 to 2. Paul says, I urge you, therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern, the thinking of the world on work, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Do not conform to the world's idea of work. Offer the fruit of your labors as worship to the Lord. 
And then finally, a prayer from Paul in Philippians 1, 3 to 6 that I want to pray over all of you here. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. So here's my final questions. How will I do work this week as worship unto the Lord? How are you going to do that this week, folks? And then secondly, how will the, will the way that I work tomorrow change as I begin to work for the Lord and not for people? How are things going to change for me as I begin to work for the Lord and not for my employer? What's going to change? So we're going to get into small groups, and this is going to be groups of three or four, no more, so that everybody gets a chance to talk. I know we usually don't do this on Sunday mornings, but we're going to do it. I'm in charge right now. Can I, I can do this, right, Joe? Break you into groups of three or four, so start looking around, going, man, I, I think I'll, I'll talk with them. And uh, I want you to answer these two questions, folks. We're going to take just a few minutes. How will I do my work as worship this week? And then secondly, how will I work tomorrow Working for the Lord is not for my employer. I want you to have just a short discussion, maybe three minutes, four minutes, in groups of three or four, no more. And here's the reason, folks. I, I can come in, I can speak, and you go, wow, that was challenging. Man, that was really cool. I, I learned some, you know, challenging ideas. But if you don't leave here changed, this Sunday morning service was a waste of your time. And it was a waste of my time. C can I say that? Every time you come to church, every time Joe knocks it out of the park with another sermon or Pastor Steve, Steve, are you here? I didn't even see you this morning. Are you out there somewhere? Is, is he not here today? Okay, I, I, miss, I miss Steve as well. So, so every time these guys put all this work into the sermon and you guys just go out through those plate glass doors going, man, that was challenging. It was a waste of Joe's time and Steve's time. They put work into these messages. God is speaking through them so that you can leave with at least one thing that can change in your life for the next week. Can, can I say that? We come to church to be changed, amen? So get into your groups right now and tell your, your uh, small group, this is how my work's gonna change this week. This is how I'm gonna work as unto the Lord and not for my employer. Have a discussion on that for about three, four minutes, and then I'm gonna close us in prayer and, uh, and turn it back to you, Joe, to, to get us out to our potluck, all right? So get into your groups, three or four, no more, all right? And have a discussion.